Good evening, everyone. Um, for those of you who may be joining us for your first session, I am Stephanie Coleman. I'm the Autism Family Educator with the Kansas LEN program at KU Medical Center. LEN stands for Leadership Education and Neurodevelopmental and Related Disabilities. And we're excited to have you join us tonight. Um, tonight's session is on exploring intersectionality, Black parents raising youth with disabilities with Kim Riley, Executive Director from the Transition Academy. And we also have um, LEN trainees, uh, Philip Magruder and Rahel Kebedi to also be here joining. Hi, Philip. Um, just a few things before we get started. I want to remind you if um, the slide, there's no slides up when you're on Facebook or uh, when there are no slides up, we are live on Facebook and your video will show. So you, if you don't have your camera on, your name won't show up or anything like that on um, Facebook. Um, for those of you on Facebook watching, Thank you for joining us as well. Um, if you have any questions during the session, please put them in the comments and we will get them asked of the, the speakers. Um, for those of you here on Zoom, go ahead and put any questions you may have in the chat box and we will get those answered as well. Um, let's see, I think that is that covers everything. So I will turn this over to Kim. Are you ready, Kim? I'm ready. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Kim Riley. Okay, good evening, everyone. I am um, excited to um, talk with you all. It seems like um, it seems like it's it's just being in the company of friends, so um, that makes it all the all the better. Um, thank you so much for um, reaching out to me. Um, we talked yesterday and um, it was, I was kind of like, okay, well, what direction are we going? And it seems like we were going more of a, almost like a fireside chat <laughs> or intimate gathering, so to speak. So I said, okay, well, then I will keep it um, kind of informal um, and um, just kind of, um, just kind of be as authentic as I know how. So, um, um, so as we enter, um, kind of wrap up Autism Awareness Month, I think about just uh, my journey. My son Kendall was diagnosed with autism in April of 2001. Um, he's now 23, and um, our so our journey began. And um, I just remember being lost and confused, and um, I at the time didn't know anyone in my family um, who had the diagnosis. And um, as time went on, um, more questions, but also more friends that I was able to connect with. Um, and, and so um, as one of the things that I noticed like many of, of us is that when they're little and cute, um, there are so many opportunities. Um, but somewhere around um, upper elementary and middle school, the cuteness wears off. And boy, those opportunities, they just start shrinking and shrinking. And so um, the way it's um, played out for us is every child is rambunctious, um, it, it kind of hard-headed. <laughs> um, at the toddler um, stage and we're very forgiving of them. But um, when, they, when they get older, we're not so forgiving. We don't, um, we, we question uh, whether the parents discipline them or what's going on. Um, and the way that it played out for me um, being um, African-American, you know, we, um, at least in my family um, and during the time that I was raised, we talked, we focused a lot on corporal punishment. So it was, he just needs a whooping, you know? And I'm like, well, if you could beat autism out of them, you know, <laughs> we, we would not be here. It's just literally not that simple. And so um, we've had the, the whispers and the stares um, and, um, and just like everyone else. Um, but I 
I tell people our situation was even more dire. Uh, my son is 6'4", he's over 300 pounds, and he's always been a big boy. Uh, when he was born, he was 10 days overdue. Um, so I was big and pregnant and hot, hot all summer long. And then he, um, as a typical uh, mama's boy, he just did not want to come out. He would, he could, would still be in the womb to this day, I guess. Um, so he had, we had to, um, he had to be induced and then he came out. Um, and I remember at that moment feeling a sense of, um, of, I don't know if it, the word is dread, but I, I definitely felt a sense of trepidation that I had a boy. Um, I wanted a girl. Um, my favorite writer is Maya Angelou. And so, you know, it, his name, he was going to be a she and her name was going to be Maya Angelou. Her name's going to be Lil Maya and she's going to have all these little princess dresses. And then I had a boy and I was disappointed because I wanted my girl. I wanted ribbons, bows and lace. And here comes this big boy. And um, he was so big. He was eight pounds, 13 and a half ounces, but he was 22 inches long. And the doctor called him Baby Shaq. And I want to find that doctor to this day and say, you did this. Because <laughs> he's just like an oak tree that just keeps growing. But also, um, uh, along with that disappointment that I didn't get my girl, I knew the burden of raising a boy. And I thought, oh my goodness, I am really in for it. And the older that Kendall got, the bigger he got, the more um, his behaviors um, exacerbated with puberty, um, the more issues that we had, um, the, the more concerns that I had. And so um, we've had a long journey. I knew that I was one of the moms who co-founded the KC Walk for Autism Awareness. If any of you remember that, um, worked with Robin Jordan and um, Robin Russell and a bunch of um, amazing moms to make that happen. And um, I remember how excited we were at mobilizing the disability community and letting families know they had um, voices and that there were resources. Um, and then um, I think our kids got older and we all just kind of were just trying to keep our heads above water with uh, raising adolescents. And, um, and so, um, as our journey began and we were at that hopeful stage, um, it didn't feel so hopeful once we got to adolescence. And as I started looking at um, the role that I really wanted to play, um, I realized that transition was my spot. Um, I realized that there were lots of awareness and um, cute little kids activities, but there needed to be some help with transition. I thought about um, my journey as a first generation college student, and there were so many resources for um, a, a young black girl on Kansas City's east side born to a, a teenage mom. And I wanted, um, and I kept saying, why don't we have that for our kids? Why are our kids just kind of left to fend for themselves? And so I decided to do something about it. And I decided to create a nonprofit called the Transition Academy, where we would reimagine and redesign uh, the transition process so that it was just um, a lot more transparent and a lot easier for families to just explore and, um, and to um, ensure that youth graduate from high school um, and they seamlessly transition to their life after high school. And um, then we were all said, one of the things we wanted to do was have bus tours. Um, we wanted to visit college campuses, job training programs and employment sites. Um, and we were all set to have our first bus tour on a Monday and then stay at home orders 
<laughs> hit on Friday. So, so much for that. Um, and so we went to a virtual space like everyone else in March of 2020. And um, I, my son graduated in 19, thank goodness. Um, and so I reached out to other families just to see how they were faring. And they, I was infuriated to hear that they were told um, that even though the rest of the kids were given really um, humane messages um, about you know, social emotional health and we're here for you. Um, instead, our kids were really told um, here are the federal and state mandates that we have to follow. And in other words, this is what we have to do for your child and so that and you can't sue us. And I was absolutely infuriated. And I thought, um, let's come together. And so I developed Tuesday Talks, um, a weekly forum for us to just connect. And this was when we thought COVID was going to be over with in May. Do you all remember the good old days? <laughs> okay, we can ride this out for two months. <laughs> so I thought, yeah, this will be fine. We'll be done in six weeks. <laughs> and so we started off having sessions like how to manage challenging behaviors at home, uh, we had some sessions on how to have the talk with your child about sexuality. And then COVID went on and on and on and on. <laughs> and we continue to have two seat talks. Well, then um, the George Floyd protests hit. And that was a huge shift. Um, this was, um, I, for, and of course, uh, his brutal murder has impacted the whole world and none of us will ever be the same after, after watching that brutality. But for Black families, it, um, especially those with disabilities, it took us to a whole nother place. Um, this intersection of race and ability is rarely explored and it really came like to a nexus um, for us with the uh, the protest. I remember um, reading, um, I, well, I remember my son um, lives in group home. He was under um, lockdown. He, I could visit him at one point once a week, but he couldn't come home. And so I was really careful about staying at home and isolating myself so that I didn't test positive so that I couldn't um, jeopardize him or any of his housemates. Um, and so as the protests were going on, I was feeling even more isolated because I couldn't you know, voice my opinion or, or be a part of anything or, or connect with anyone. And so um, I remember as everyone was issuing statements of against racism, um, I, I remember the Autism Society of America. They issued a statement on human rights. And they said, we stand in solidarity with peaceful protesters. And I, my heart sank. It felt like a punch in the gut. Everyone all over the world has seen this image and we know we are point blank talking about racism. How in the world can you issue a statement about anything and not address race? It was such a slap in the face that the oldest autism organization in the world did not have the balls to call it what it was. And it was, it was, spitting in the faces of Black families to tell us that we will play it safe and not rub other folks the wrong way and we will just cast you all aside. And if that wasn't enough, um, the, if you read the statement, then on their Facebook page, there was feedback from different 
uh, people who, who said things like, well, everyone wants to always make everything about race, um, but everyone's about, everyone gets bullied. And I'm going, how can you see this image, this video over and over and, and water it down to bullying? And so we were, and so as I talk with other families um, and other black families, we said, we, um, we really felt like we needed to be heard. And so we hosted a webinar called Out of the Shadows, Black Families with Autism Speak Out. And we had parents who talked about what it's like to raise black sons with invisible disabilities that play out with troubling behavior, behavior that can really, um, that's weird, but can be seen as threatening. And so those families um, shared their stories. And then we also had a, um, a white gentleman who's talked about what it means to be a white ally. And he um, is a self-advocate and um, as we talked in the true spirit of, of, of accommodations, I asked him if he wanted to be on the show and if he um, would share um, his thoughts on what it means to be a white ally. And he said, well, Kim, I'm deeply honored. I don't do well live. And I said, well, can you pre-record your message then? And boy, did he do a phenomenal job. He said that um, being a white ally means speaking out when other white people say things that are absolutely reprehensible in your presence because they think that you think like them. No going along, getting along. You speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. Then he also said, um, being a white ally, it means, um, it means that Black lives matter. It means um, whether they are peaceful protesters or they are looters. And he spoke um, just really very, in a very impassioned uh, message. And um, at the conclusion of that, the evening session, I remember we went over by 30 minutes. And for some reason, we attracted people from all over the nation. We had people who found us. These were families in Massachusetts of all places. Somehow they found us. Families in Florida, Texas, North Carolina, Chicago, they found us um, because we really craved community. And we basically had a, a virtual support group um, session. And um, that webinar ended up being cited by the CDC as a best practice. And um, and, you know, and I'm sorry, I, I'm, if I feel like, if I sound like I'm rambling, I wanted this to be just really authentic. <laughs> um, so as we had the webinar, um, we also, we had to do some soul searching about the Transition Academy, um, who we were serving, and um, what impact we wanted to make. And so um, even in the aftermath of the webinar, we had to look at um, Black families and so much of what we do to go along, to get along. Um, when we talk about having the talk, um, white families typically think the talk is about sex. Um, but Black families, the talk is um, when our boys in particular when they start driving, we have a very serious talk with them about what to do when, not if, but when they are pulled over by the police. We tell them um, to follow orders. We tell them to, um, to say, um, officer, I am reaching for my ID, to talk with them every step of the way. And we give them all of these um, tips on what to do so that they can come home to us alive. 
this has been going on since the beginning of time, but it was something that we simply did not talk about. And it came out during the uh, George Floyd protest. Uh, as we talked, um, even during the webinar, we talked about this very dicey position that we're in, um, in this space, living Black, um, but then um, also being a part of the disabilities community. It's hard enough to just be Black. And so when we're in those spaces and when George Floyd protests and other um, issues erupt, we immediately, we, I, we understand the historical oppression um, and we definitely align ourselves with our Black brothers and sisters. Um, and we leave disability out of it because we, it's hard enough to just be black. Um, then when we're in the disability space, my goodness, my brothers and sisters in the disability community, I feel a closeness with them um, that I don't feel with even some of my family members um, because I can be candid and some of the issues that I'm going through, I don't even have to verbalize. Um, you are, I'm not judged. If Kendall's going through something, everyone just, Kim, it's going to be all right. And then we'll share. My child is also going through and, and, and we just, we are family. Um, however, I tend to leave race out of it because it's hard enough just dealing with life in the disability community. And so um, the post-George Floyd protest um, was a moment of personal reckoning for me. Um, as a leader of a new baby nonprofit organization that is focusing on um, transition success, um, making sure that I was really intentional and impactful um, about reaching out to black and brown youth. Um, and, and, it, and so I had to dig a little deeper um, when I even did a little research on um, just how prevalent the issue was, because again, it, we don't talk about it very often. And so when I found out about the incarceration rates of blacks, black men, um, with disabilities, that by age 18, more than half of Black men with disabilities are arrested. And um, I remember the, um, the guy who was in the webinar um, on what it means to be a white ally, he gave an example. He said that, unfortunately, with autism, he said, uh, being stopped by the police is actually a rite of passage for us because our behaviors can be seen as threatening. And he said, um, and he talked about how he had been stopped multiple times by the police. Um, and he said, the um, difference is that when I am stopped, I have every assurance that I will make it out alive and my black brothers do not. Um, and, and again, um, as I was just kind of come, coming to terms with what it means to be a leader of a new nonprofit, um, and I just started just looking for research, um, because again, race and ability really isn't broached, uh, breached very often. And so um, just finding um, that even some of the very um, premises that are the foundation of uh, transition, they can be problematic uh, within communities of color. Um, many of the transition supports, they focus on being independent, that your goal is when you're 18 to be your own own person to be independent to you know to do the Frank Sinatra I did it my way stance um, and that is um, that goes in direct contradiction to the way communities of colors operate 
which is from a lens of being interdependent. Um, you're not successful if you just make it by yourself, but you make it and then you give back and you make it and you make sure that your family is successful. Um, you don't just make it and get yours and leave the community, you come back and you um, make sure that you share with the community. So um, even those tenets of transition, making sure that I was aware of the space that we were in and, um, and how to really lead our families. Um, and so as we move forward with just trying to um, just trying to, to make sense of this and where do we go? Um, realizing that transition is really um, about, it's about liberation um, in the best sense. If we are able to be financially successful and have economic freedom, um, then that is the best way um, to ensure that we have opportunities and that um, youth and families are successful. And so our mission statement, as you can see, um, is to make sure um, that economic inclusion is a reality for youth with disabilities, um, but especially for young people of color, those black and brown youth who have historically been failed by systems. And so um, as we strive to make that mark, um, it we still have to kind of live in both worlds, right? And so um, Melissa Thompson's quote says it best. Um, and she says that um, the issue that she has within both black and black spaces and disability spaces is that people want to fragment you. Um, and she's saying that um, in the black space, you recognize my blackness. In the disability space, you embrace my disability. But she's saying, if I'm going to be in your space, you need to see all of me instead of seeing the part of me that is similar to you. And so um, those are just a few of my thoughts on um, raising a Black son with invisible disabilities in a world that is not um, forgiving, um, is not accepting of Black men, period. Okay. Thanks, Kim, for that. Um, I have so many questions, but um, before we get into questions, I want to um, let Philip um, go ahead and speak and talk to us um, and tell us a little bit about um, his background and history and his, more importantly, his successes. And you're on mute, Philip. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> How's everybody doing out there? How are you doing? How you doing, Brad? How you doing, Steph? How you doing, Rael, Sean, uh, Kim? Thank you for being here, and uh, I'm glad that you're one of the folks speaking on this. Uh, your your issues that you're dealing with on the regular as an individual Black woman is is no different from what my mama had to deal with, especially on September 22nd, 1991. Well, that's not the year I was diagnosed, but that was the year I was born. But uh, let's just say 12 months later after my birth, that's when the problems that my mom started noticing that this is around the time in 1992-ish where autism was known at the time. Well, under that medical book known as mental retardation, I'm just gonna say it out there and I hope anybody who's listening is not offended by that word. We've all heard that word, especially thrown at our way throughout our whole lives, especially with me being a black man, not only hearing the R word and the S word, but also the N word too, is almost like doing dealing with two sides of the coin, which is almost tough to handle, but for 30 years of life, I've dealt with it pretty well. And I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I know we don't have much time. And uh, well, um, I'm a KU uh, graduate. 
uh, how did that journey begin when I got there and everything like that? And how did I work with the Kansas City Chiefs and also with uh, the Self Advocate Coalition in Kansas and also being the Lynn training? Um, my journey started in Kansas City, Kansas. I was born and raised. Um, raised to my father, Marvin McGrady, who was born in 1938, September 10th, uh, Kansas City, Kansas. My mom, June 8th, 1949, in Ringo, Louisiana. She lived in Ringo, Louisiana for 10 years of, of till she moved up in 1959 at age 10 um, during the Jim Crow South. And uh, my parents lived through that Jim Crow era. And um, they lived through the era where they saw the signs that said, no colors allowed. You had to go to the back to get your food or, you know, you couldn't eat in a restaurant and going through all those things. And those things had a stress on them. And I probably thought that down the road, that spiritual thing would carry on with me and my brother and my sister, you know, that later down the road when we would become born. And I feel like those things is what made me realize that the same things that they went through are the same things I'm going to go through myself. Um, dealing with autism, I never really discovered it until seventh grade, which um, around the time my mom explained what it was. And I kind of like, you know, like you're a kid in a Disney movie, you feel like you're the protagonist, you go through those similar situations, those coming of age stories. I felt like my life was almost like that growing up. And when my mom told me what it was, I was like, ma, it, people are gonna call me the S word or the R word in school. Cause this is around the days where you had hip hop era and kids thinking that they saying all this other things that makes them look cool and stuff. And it's still the same generation today. Let's just say it's dumber. I'm just gonna put it out there. I'm sorry, just what I witnessed witness in the day. But anyway, uh, I've dealt with a lot of hardships, not only with dealing with the racism side, because racism was always there. And plus, my mom was always told me about the stuff she witnessed growing up during that period, especially my father, because my father was a Navy uh, chief petty officer since 1959 to 1979. And he dealt with that as well. Um, I dealt with also folks who look like me as well. We also have to address that because part of it is a lot of our folks are dealing with post-traumatic slavery disorder, which is the effects of slavery. It has affects all of our people. We're to the point it just made us hate each other and we're going through the plans and we're still in slaves in our minds, not just black folks, which is the first thing that happened, but everybody. Because fr my friend, Colin, one of my uh, mentors along with Brad, you told me the same fight that your parents fought years ago is our fight as well. And what I saw yesterday when I went to the state capitol, it was a real confirmation of that. So that's a conversation for another day. But anyway, uh, the things that helped me out was using my skills, my strengths, which was, yeah, I was quiet, I was calm, but I took my time. I used the IEPs. My mother and my father worked with me to help me spell my name and to comprehend and to do the things I needed to do to become the person that you see today. I mean, I needed to spell my name because I didn't need to know that my name is spelled with an F, but it starts with a P-H-I. And I needed to know all those things, you know, how to, how to count and spell, how to have your own bank account. Just like I never knew at 30 years old, I had my own apartment. I never thought at 30 years old, by 30 years old, I would get to live my dreams that I get to live. And I'm living those dreams because I took my time. I didn't want to rush into things. There were times I wanted to do the things I wanted to do, which was be like a normal kid with everybody else, but I always had to remember that I'm a black kid in America and with autism. And it's almost, like I said at the beginning of this, that it's almost like a two sides of the coin thing you gotta deal with. Almost like a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde type of situation or like Batman and Bruce Wayne type of deal. It's kind of like that when my life is like for real, but from the race side, you do deal with those situations. Just like when you mentioned Miss Kim about the George Floyd situation, I had a situation that I referenced in uh, the autism lifespan last week, two weeks ago at the KU Edwards campus, which was two weeks after George Floyd was murdered, there was a police call come to my house, which nobody in our neighborhood ever called the police. They just came out of nowhere. And next thing you know, they came and talked to my sister. She was outside talking with them. And as soon as I step foot outside, I get, there he is. And within those seconds, I'm thinking, hey, y'all, it was nice knowing y'all. Everybody at SAC, if you hear on the news that something happened to me, 
Just know I didn't do nothing. That's just all I was going to say. And then after within those seconds, when I was thinking all that, as I almost like a flash of light going through your mind, we're just kidding with you, man. <laughs> just a little cop humor. <laughs> it was one of those, I get it, but that was an inappropriate thing to do at the time because this is a situation that happened two weeks ago. And then you guys play with that, which is almost like you feel like because you're in that position, you could do that, but you never asked to know me. It speaks on people today that maybe people will get it. Maybe they won't. And if the, the people that won't get it, they'll figure it out because I believe God leads us to certain situations and things happen for a reason. Just like that guy who did that to me, you never know. He might be going through a situation that somebody that he loves is going through something. And maybe he does it as a way to be like, you know, just to, you know, make my job fun and interesting and make life interesting. That's how people think today. And maybe it's not a race situation. Maybe it was. But when you take those situations into consideration, from my view, I have to worry about that my mama and my sister have to worry about me coming home every day despite my success. They don't care if I have a Super Bowl ring. They don't care if I work with the Kansas City Chiefs part-time. They don't care if I'm a self-advocate trainee at Self-Advocate Coalition of Kansas. They don't care if I'm a Lynn trainee or a college graduate. And I've always said this, and I still worry about it every day, especially when I go to work. I got to wait and make sure I come home because of this color here. And that's something I always think about every day. Just like even Ms. Coleman, you noticed me when I was in DC. It's just always that thought when I'm, when I'm around is because I just want to live. I want to continue to live my dreams and do what I do. And when people say, Philip, when you're doing the right thing, I want to keep doing those things that keep having people saying you're doing the right thing. And, um, I hope everybody likes uh, what I said today. And once again, Ms. Kim, thank you for speaking uh, your mind on what it's like to deal with that. I thank you for what you do. And also Ms. Coleman, thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, speak on this, especially from this perspective, because this is something I've been, it's been on my heart for pretty much 30 years of my whole life. Because at the end of the day, the people that I think about every day, who's always my inspiration is my mama and my daddy, my brother and sister especially my parents, because they went through it, especially 60 years before any of us were probably born to try to fight this fight that we're going through. Yeah, like somebody just said there, I'm going to continue to raise the heat. So. Robin. Robin, yeah, yeah Robin. girl, I'm going to raise the heat. So yeah, I know yeah. there's the Moto G. So thank you, everybody. Yeah. And once again, raise the heat. Thank you, Philip. Yeah, yeah. I'm, of course I would have you because there is nobody else better to talk about this. I mean, obviously I can't talk about this. So hey, Philip. Um, yes, Robin. Um, I have learned honestly about uh, the day when I brought up the coffee issue. You taught me a lot. I know. Thank you. And that's good. And we do, you know, I mean, there's lots of learning moments in every direction and we all have to be open to those learning moments. And, you Absolutely. know, Philip, no matter how long it takes you, um, you know, you said you take your time. Well, it doesn't matter. As long as you finish and you complete and hit those milestones, it doesn't matter how long it takes. Absolutely. And uh, one more thing I wanted to mention, two things I want to mention. Uh, absolutely. Uh I said this to the Arrowhead fans and call, okay, and there's a funny story, real quick story. I'm not going to take too much time on this. Uh, we were down 24 to zero to the Texans. And at that moment, I was getting ready to quit on the job. Like, F this. We, we will never win another Super Bowl. Then I heard something in my head said, no, you get back out there and you get your fans involved. Next thing you know, I said the words that speaks to what you're saying, Ms. Coleman. It's not how you start. It's how you finish. We might be down 24 to nothing, but it ain't over. Then 31 points later and 51 points later, we are Super Bowl champions after that or something like that. So anyway, that's that point where it's just don't ever give up. Just take your time. And oh, yeah, to Robin on that second point, I'm glad that you learn about the police. But this is the thing about it. I know people who are police officers and they're really good people. Just like, for example, The Wire is one of my all time favorite TV shows. And part of it is half cop show, half, you know, People might say a gangster show like a TV show, Goodfellas, but you get both sides where you see these as human beings, despite what they do or where they're labeled as, just like who we are as individuals, because we all have one goal at the end of the day is trying to common, 
accomplish our successes. And that's what the police are trying to do as well. Cause you got a police officer today who wants to like work an honest pay. And you got cops who work like 16 cases, especially murder cases. And it's almost hard enough to even get one through there, especially when you're investigating. And those are a lot of things you gotta take into consideration, especially also knowing to have a good relationship with them as well is also important. But I feel like it's important that we continue to talk and have those conversations, you know. I understand defunding the police, but at the same time, I believe conversation and getting to the point and also having, you know, now I would say like monitoring the police where everybody in the community monitors the police and the police people within the organization monitor those individuals who are, might be labeled as bad apples. And I also suggest people to go see this show that's coming out on HBO called Next Week called We Own This City, because it speaks to what I'm talking about now, because there is not just saying it's the police, it's just a lot of people, especially in politics, just like what we saw yesterday in Topeka, police, wherever, it's just bad people in the world. And that's mainly who's the cause of these things and why we might be having these talks. So I just want to put that out there. So like I said, raise the heat. And Philip, um, we are um, also exploring um, partnering with Black law enforcement executives of Kansas City yes. to actually um, address this issue. To, to um, I don't think any of us have the answer, but we know that we have to talk. And so we are exploring some partnerships uh, to make sure that um, we do some education, uh, to make sure that we um, our children are safe and um, to try to make a difference. Well, I'm glad that they're open to having these conversations and you know, there's, it's a starting point and, and going from there, that's good to hear. Yes, many um, officers, you know, autism in particular knows no bounds. Right. And so many of them have children. There's no discrimination, them. yeah. Many of them have children who are on the spectrum. And so, um, you know, um, the, ability piece um, kind of is, it covers all, but um, the race piece um, is definitely a huge issue um, that we're grappling with. And so um, hopefully we'll be sharing some more information with you all. Yeah, it's definitely pass it along when you do. Candace? I was gonna ask you, Ms. Kim. Well, thank you both. You guys know me quiet, and I am a quiet, Mr. Stephanie But I was gonna ask you, Ms. Kim, for that project, have you talked to uh, Vicki Davidson from the Missouri Disability Council? I haven't talked to Vicki lately. Um, I'm a um, one of the partners in policy making grads. Oh yeah. And so um, I def I'm on the mailing list and you know she's just like one of my favorite people on the planet. So yeah. She might be a good partnership to when you work with you know she does the disaster and those kind of trainings. So okay. she might be a good one to talk to when okay. connected to the police. Okay. Thank you, Candace. Um, we, we've had um, one of my um, classmates from Mizzou, he's a major. And so we had coffee and then um, he invited me to um, a session with like the larger group. And so we're just like planting the seeds, but I would definitely love to um, talk to Vicki and get her thoughts and advice. Thank you. Thanks. Rahel? Rahel. Yes. Hello, would you like to share for just a couple of minutes about your experiences and your family? Yes. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Rahil Kapeda. I am married and I have four kids. Um, I am also a, lend, a family lend trainee. Um, my oldest son, Caleb, he's almost 18 now. Um, he was diagnosed uh, with Duchenne muscular dystrophy and autism at the age of three. Um, he's born and raised here, but my husband and I are from Ethiopia. Um, we moved here about just over 20 years ago. So um, at the time uh, when my son got his diagnosis, we, we did face some challenge. Uh, one was just learning the disability word as you know, it's all, it was all new to us in a, a new country, in a new culture. And it was just, 
a little too hard for us. That was 14 years ago. Um, and also being not from here, having different culture, um, that does add up to the challenge that we, we faced. Um, for example, as far as my friends and families, um, we are from Ethiopia, so we do have a different view when it comes to disability or autism. Um, so, they, you know, um, my close family, they, they did say, oh, this person was a late talker, so he will be fine, just, you know, give him time. Or they might say, um, um, he will grow out of it. So one day he'll grow out of it, you don't need to do anything. Um, so that kind of, you know, put a stop to, you know, my eagerness to find a solution or to find intervention earlier. Um, um, also, um, there is a thing that we say, oh, it's the white people condition because you see them out in public and you assume, oh, it's mostly white. So it's the white people problem. So that was the view uh, most of my community had. Um, but then I figured out because it's because we don't take them out. If, if you have a child with a disability, you keep them home. It's embarrassing. It's, um, you don't take them out to socialize or to be in public. So that was the reason, you know, it's just a misinformation um, saying, oh, it's not our problem. It's, it's, it's the majority of the white people. Um, and the other uh, thing was um, therapy. That, that, that's something which is not really accepted in our culture too. They think it's a waste of time, it's a waste of money, it does not work, it's just, you know. Um, so those things were um, at first hard for me because I hear, yes, he needs it. And then my culture says, no, you don't need it, you know, just wait and see. Uh, but I learned to put myself out there and, you know, just get everything that I can to support uh, my son. So um, on top of that, um, my church community also is Ethiopian. So, you know, they have the same view as far as, you know, uh, he will grow out of it is something, um, uh, it, it will take time, but he will speak, he will change, he will talk. Uh, but then um, there's also the spiritual side of it. Oh, you know, in, in, he must have, you know, they, they assume kids with autism or any disability are possessed by the you know, evil spirit. And if they pray over them, they will, you know, they will be healed. And they would, uh, there was a time I was asked, do you have faith? Do you believe that he can be healed? And by not happening, then it's me failing to have faith for my son to be healed. So um, we did went through those uh, kind of struggles. And um, now um, I'm happy to say that even back home, things have changed. There's more awareness and acceptance of, you know, kids with this. And then, you know, even they have centers that they care for those kids and take care of them, even though they're not uh, put into a public school with the typical kids. But, you know, it's more accepted right now. So it's a good thing. Um, that was the challenge we have. Uh, and at first when he was diagnosed, like I said, I was new to everything and my English is not good. I have accent and, you know, making friends and getting in those small support groups was, it was a challenge for me because I would go and I would be the only one black, the only one with a broken English and trying to make myself fit in that small group was really hard. And I, I had to force myself just to stay and just try to be you know, more friendly so they can help me, they can support me or, you know, just putting myself there. And I did struggle with that. Uh, and, um, um, but now things have changed. So that was that. And um, as far as his school life, uh, the, the most part is really good. I mean, we had really good support and team that works, you know, to find what, what is best for my son. And we're blessed with that. But I, at first we did came across a challenge and Sean, I, he, he probably don't remember, it's been years, but I saw him uh, speaking at one of the libraries and I'm, I'm always searching for resource. So I learned that he's gonna talk about autism and everything. So I'm like, I'm going. So I went there, I listened to what he said and I took his card 
wiped away. And then I called him. I said, I need your help. So he was nice enough to let me, you know, go to his office. He took his time, you know, listening to my problem and how I can. Uh, it was that time was um, they wanted my son to be moved to a different school, which is not a school I want him to go to. Uh, I did not want him to be isolated and just put in a, a group class just to keep him there and not with the typical. So I was fighting that. I wanted him to stay homeschooled, you know, um, at the school that's near to our house, but not putting him somewhere where they want him to go. So Sean really helped me with that. And he, he got me, you know, all the things that I can say to you know, defend my side, and I did, and I won that case, and I, even the principal was in it, and the psychologist, and they were kind of, you know, telling me that I don't have that much knowledge to fight them, not to send my son where their choices, uh, and I was against it, and I'm like, I'm, mm -mm, I'm the mom, and I won in there, and these are my rights, and I wrote all the numbers that Sean gave me, and I start saying those quotes, and finally, they're like, what agency is working for you? Who's working for you? And I'm like, I'm not saying, I'm not saying. <laughs> so finally we, we ended up winning. And then after so many meetings, um, he got to stay where his home school is. But um, the, uh, I mean, that process was the hardest I remember, but nowadays, you know, there's Facebook group, there are so many um, organizations that you can get help in any, anything that you want. And, I wish things were this easy when I learned about my son's diagnosis, but um, I feel like I'm right now blessed with so, so many, so many friends and so many resources. And this is like the best time ever. So I'm, I feel like I'm one of the luckiest people to be here and to talk to you and to share my story. Thank you. Rahel, I am the lucky one. I am so glad that you went anyways even though that you were the only black not you know english broken speaking mom i'm glad you continued to go to continue to search out research resources and find things so that you could ultimately find your way to us so um it's been a pleasure getting to know you over the last couple of years so um yes and you're an amazing advocate for caleb absolutely so um I really want to ask, um, there's so many questions and, and if anybody has questions, please, you know, feel free. This is like Kim said, we're kind of like a, like a living room chat, fireside chat. Um, so please take off. You don't have to turn your camera on if you're not comfortable, you know, just take your mic off and ask the questions. But, um, one of my biggest questions is, um, you know, Rahel hit it when she said, she was the only black mom there in that that group at that time. How can we help families? Or even, you know, she mentioned also the culture um, and not believing um, that, you know, they thought the disability should be either hidden or he'd grow out of it. How can we help families that are newly diagnosed not to have to hit those kind of walls? Okay, can you restate that, Stephanie? I'm just trying to make sure I answer appropriately. Yeah, so like new, newly diagnosed families, um, you know, kiddos with um, that are newly diagnosed. So how can we help them like either, and it's probably a two-part question, right? Like, first of all, how can we help them, you know, be just like Rahel and go out and get the information and you know, it's okay that you, you might be the only one there right now, um, but this is the information you need for your child so that you can best support them. And then my other thing is, you know, the, the culture issue, because even you mentioned, um, you know, just beat him out of it. He'll get better, right? Like, how can we help those families understand that autism is just 
you know, they're still the same, same person. There's just going to be other things that we have to deal with along the way. Well, you know, first of all, Kendall was diagnosed over 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm, um, and so autism is just so prevalent now. Um, I don't know that that mentality is as prevalent um, as, you know, it was 20 years ago. Um, I think that it's just kind of like anything. Those of us who are women, um, we know what it's like to have to um, have our own space. Um, we have our, you know, groups with uh, men and women, but then we always form a women's group so that we can support one another. And so I think that people of color just need their own space as well. Um, I think that actually, you know, again, I always felt welcomed in any of um, the support groups and um, any of the gatherings. Again, I feel um, my disabilities community, that is also my family. That's another part of my family. So I don't, I think that um, just by being aware, having presentations like, like this, um, and then also um, there seems to be a spirit of competitiveness in the disability space. There are people who enjoy being the, the martyr. <laughs> uh, they, they have all the answers and they want everybody to come to them. And I really don't want to do that. <laughs> I just, it's, it's too lonely to, to, you know, want to, to do it all. And so I, I really too much to do <laughs> anyways exactly. and what kind of sleep crown, sometime <laughs> what kind of crown is that to have i am the disability advocate princess of like what on earth you know let mm -hmm. me, I, i'll take another title but that's just not one <laughs> and yeah. so i think that also um encouraging um communities of color like if you hear of an organization um like uh, the Transition Academy, um, and you know of black, uh, black and brown families, um, even if they don't say that they need support, um, making them aware of organizations like ours, um, it really isn't either or. You're not just in a black uh, disability uh, support group or just in a white one, you know. Mm -hmm. we, it just doesn't have to be like that. But sometimes you really need someone who's going through exactly what you're going through to just be able to talk. So I think that we um, we can and we must coexist. I don't think it's that hard. And um, I just, I think I applaud um, you all for um, having this discussion and um, just starting the, the dialogue and the process for collaboration on a deeper level. Um, we have a question in the chat, but I, before I do that, um, you know, somebody said, have more presenters, have more conversations like this. So I wanna take a moment to plug one of my favorite people who's on here. Candace um, Cunningham, she has her own Candace Corner. So Candace, will you um, just kind of mention what that Candace Corner is? Maybe. Hi, I'm <laughs> there Candace. Um, Candace's Corner is for self advocate to um, talk about their experience, um, to how they became a leader or Supporter, like you, Miss Kim, to come on to talk about transition academy and how people can get involved, mm -hmm. or how self advocates can get involved. Can you put um, how somebody can get connected to Candace Corner in the um, chat? Can I give them to my mom? No, yeah, I will. <laughs> As long as somebody puts it in there, that would be great um, so that they have that connection. So um, Leah says, what strategies can we use to connect with and support the Black community? Um, and how do we build trust and reach out acknowledging and honoring the culture? Hmm. And that's kind of what I, I think, that's a better way of um, asking what I was trying to. So thank you, Leah. Mm -hmm. um Leah, thank you for um, asking that question. Um, you know, uh, 
again, the, the Transition Academy is brand new. We were just organized in uh, 2019 and we just actually started programming in 2020. And so um, that uh, one of the, the pieces that we're really working on is uh, mobilizing uh, Black families um, black and brown families with disabilities so that we can um, we can really um, we're better together. Um, right now, I feel like I constantly get calls and texts and there's a lot of whispering um, um, and there's a lot of um, just kind of help me over this hump, but there isn't um, a real community um, support um, going on. And so we are, um, first of all, we are not calling it a support group. Uh, that is definitely not a Black thing at all. <laughs> and so the, the way, <laughs> the worst way to push people away is to call it something like a support group, because it's like, are we going to just sit in a room and cry or <laughs> what What in the world are we going to like do things? Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, the way that, Leah, the way we're approaching it is um, <clears throat> we had our first Casey Diversability College and Career Fair last week. Um, we had um, about 150 or so um, attendees from Amazing. both sides of the state line. And um, what we wanted to do, um, again, I kept saying, why is this so hard? Um, why do we use all this complicated language and then we um, tell people that the way to advocate is to understand this really crazy system and then to kind of um, translate that crazy language into your personal situation. And we just said, no, let's simplify it. And so we had um, the, we um, tried to turn the traditional fair up on its head. And so we had one room that was all of the um, traditional, you know, the colleges, the employment, you know, programs all in one room. Um, and then directly across the hall, we had Kansas and Missouri Voc Rehab. We had Kansas and Missouri pre -ed. And so what happened was the parents um, and the families that were in that fair room um, many of them said, oh my goodness, my child graduates next month. They came in with almost a spirit of desperation. And then they went to that room and they were like deer in the headlights, like, oh my goodness, now I'm overwhelmed at the options. And then we immediately pointed them, go across the hall and find out about your benefits package. And they were like, what, what's that? What, what does that mean? We'll go over there and find out. And so um, the benefits folks were able to say, okay, um, what, what um, options did you like? And one mom was like, well, he really is determined to go to MCC now. And then she said, okay, well, he is eligible for, you know, he a, has a DMH waiver and that will support this, you know, and that'll pay for this. Well, then they understand the connection between benefits and opportunities. But so often, you know, we just have convenings where we just talk. It's almost like somebody reciting a dictionary and just kind of like um, those, Candace, you don't, you're too young, but those of us who remember Charlie Brown's teacher, Womp, 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 womp. <laughs> it feels like that. So we try to break that down by just literally saying, now that you have the opportunity, now come over here and let's pay for it. And so now um, we're doing that. We also have presentations, Leah, like we had an entrepreneurship panel. And then after the panel, we said, if entrepreneurship is for you, um, then um, follow up, sign up for more. And so what we're doing is we're having, um, we're forming an entrepreneurship cohort. We're going to literally walk people through um, creating a business plan, um, applying for the PASS program, and launching businesses. And so instead of having the traditional support group, we're saying, what are your post-secondary goals? What do you, and then 
people who are who have those same goals as you, then you all are going to be a cohort. You all are going to go through the process together. And so um, we'll support them and they will naturally uh, become a support group, but we just won't call it that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, her a second question is how do we build trust and reach out acknowledging and honoring the culture is I mean is that what you're saying too is you know don't call it support group I mean like how how other how what other ways that we could maybe do that you know it's all about consistency um so it's about um you Showing know we're, consistent. We're, always, we're always in your space and you all are always nice to us. Um, we don't often get to um, really lead the, the task force. So when we come in your space, we often um, conduct ourselves in a way so that you feel comfortable. And so we don't really, um, really show our authentic selves. And so um, I think that we have to really look at ways um, that black and brown people um, can be themselves. And um, I don't know that I really have the answer. I don't, I'm not always myself when I'm in this space, um, but I do think it's a process. And I think it's about um, the more you get together um, and the more you have even some uncomfortable conversations, the more those barriers can come down. Philip, am I on the right track? Yes, ma'am. You are you're on the right track. And uh, I wanted to add a little bit on to that too. Um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. always said that um before he he he, you know, a year before his assassination, he always said, We riots are the language of the unheard. And instead of uh letting these things happen, which will lead us to a spiritual doom, we need to create programs of social uplift, something that will bring positivity and spread love that will inspire everybody else to do the same in the community, especially if it's the black community or in the disability community, the white communities or any other community throughout the whole globe. But it's about finding that love for one another and also understanding each other, where we're coming from and putting aside, like, let's say your pride and because like this goes back to Mark 10 verse 17 through 22 where Jesus was walking with his followers there was the rich man who came up to him and said Lord what must I do to get in your kingdom of heaven Jesus already told him hey man you already rich you, when I say give away your money I'm not saying give away your money where it's like give away your house you still gonna make money regardless of what you whatever you do we don't know what you do and the Bible doesn't explain what the man does but he's rich just give away all your riches the, to people who need it more than you. You have a greater treasure in heaven. The man just walked away in disappointment because it's not what he wanted to hear. And what did Jesus say while he was drawing to his uh, disciples? And by the way, my name is Philip. My mama named me one of Jesus' uh, disciples, by the way, Philip. And Philip was also a pastor as well. So anyway, he said how hard it is for the rich to get into heaven. And it's always looking for good people out there who's willing to push the agenda forward. It's not about what you know, it's who you know. And if they are willing to listen, it's good to have them on your side. If they're not, then just keep going until you find the right person. And, you know, that's just how life is, man. Life is almost like a journey, just like almost like the journey that Shrek and Donkey go on, for example, or your favorite Disney characters that you all saw growing up. So that's kind of like how it is. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, it's definitely, um, as far as respecting the culture, you have to, um, it's, it, I, I don't, that's so big and kind of overwhelming <laughs> if I think about, you know, if I thought about it that way, but it really is about forming um, really meaningful relationships. Um, and if you really care about someone, then you want to make sure that you, um, that you, you know, don't offend them and that you understand them. Um, many of my white friends, you all can tell I'm very direct. And um, I remember years ago, I was uh, working 
at some place and I always changed my hairstyle and I came in with braids, which the month of July, my hair will always be braided. I, it's too hot for words. So <laughs> I come into work and um, they were, and so my white colleagues were oohing and on. And then um, one of them went to grab my, uh, to touch my hair. And that is a big no, no. No, no, exactly. Oh my God. No. Oh. Like, yeah. No. It was like, oh, that's I, I was like, what are you ooh, doing? Like, you you no. Kryptonite, you know, I was, what are you doing? Especially my hair, a black man's hair. hair. No. Get your hands out of my hair. You know, like it is sacrilegious. And Candace and Philip, I mean, it, I know, I know what you I know. So we had to have a conversation about wow, black hair. A conversation. And, exactly. You, it, it, it so uh, they were like, really? And so I said, um, and so she said, I've done that before. And I said, and she talked about you like a dirty dog after it was over with. I'm telling you, you just don't do that. And so again, it it that's how you. And so we had this whole conversation about black hair, and you know, and how we are, you know, how serious <laughs> it is. And, you know, blah, 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 blah. I'm sorry, I kind of make a joke with this. Now we're talking about black hair. I blame Chris Rock for all this for making, making that movie good hair. You know what, Chris? Maybe maybe Will Smith was right to do that. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> it's a joke. Well, this was before the um before the that. documentary, but right. those are the kind of conversations that you have right with, with people um that when you're <laughs> getting to know them or or you you just you have those conversations and um. It, and sometimes, um, again, if you are sincere, um, you sometimes you're going to make some missteps, but, you know, it's all a part of getting to know someone who's different. So I would just say, just be authentic. And if you work at it from a personal level, um, then that is um, what it really takes to, to be authentic. So Kim, here's the thing, um, you know, you are, Rahel, I'll get you in one second. Um, you know, you're here in Kansas City um, in the Transition Academy. It's an amazing, I, I, I hope a lot of people will go out and, and look to see what um, the Transition Academy is all about um, and, and support it. But what about those people that aren't in Kansas City that are in, whether they're watching from Missouri or Kansas, um, and they're, you know, more in the rural areas and, um, they want to connect with black families, but they're all a, an all white organization currently. Mm. Um, how, you know, and they want to, you know, get black families to come and listen to the transition and the employment and all that kind of stuff. How can we reach out to them? How, how would you suggest reaching out to them? Well, Okay. So I, when Ken was first diagnosed, um, we were living with my grandmother in the family house right in the heart of the central city on the east side, um, 37th and Benton. And um, we always drove to the suburbs. We were in Lee Summit, Blue Springs, Liberty, uh, Johnson County, you named it, wherever it was. Um, and so one of the reasons I formed the, North, um, the Transition Academy in the Central City was because we never came to the city for anything. And it was like, okay, we've got to shift this. And so I think that there is um, room for partnership. Um, I was really inspired um, when I saw so many families who came to the KC Diversibility College and Career Fair last week. Um, they One uh, mom dr drove um, an hour from some tiny town in Kansas that I never heard of. <laughs> um, and so I think that honestly, um, especially those of us on this transition journey, um, there's so many opportunities to connect. Okay. And so um, I think it's just a matter of us um, setting it up. Um, Making some collaboration opportunities. Oh okay. yeah, oh yeah. We just came out of this pandemic. We all know how to Zoom and we, yeah. we know how to do hybrid. So it's just a matter of connecting and making We all it. became a much smaller world thanks to the yes, pandemic. And that's, you know, in ways that's really good. Um, yep. 
That's true. So we have to, you know, it's the the silver lining of the rainbows and whatnot. Um, I do want to share um, a couple of comments. Um, there was a comment on Facebook from Stephanie Sander Sanford that said this was this has been incredible. Mm -hmm. um, and then Karen Cunningham, Miss Candace's mom, um, said I had several parents tell me how happy they were to know that there are options for after high school. Mm, so, that's great. Um, yeah, that diversity thing. And then um, there was another comment here. Mm -hmm. um, Kim, you make it sound so simple and I do appreciate your style of explaining resources without them being overwhelming, so. Oh, thank you. Um, you know, um, that Karen, thank you for um, those comments from families. Um, as we were talking about how can we collaborate, that was just, to me, that was an example of the best collaboration. And when we talk about representation matters, one mom told me something and it literally um, brought tears to my eyes. Her son is 19, um, he has autism and he was at the fair, um, black male. And he told his mom um, that he said, oh we, and he was talking about me and um, members of my team and then different um, other black people who were like, um, front and center representing organizations. He said, wow, mom, and look, they're like me. And I thought we didn't intentionally do that, but for the first time in his 19 years, he saw black leaders, black faces at the forefront in the disabilities movement. And so here we all were there focusing on economic freedom. Um, and so if we can come together to push to make sure that our children are successful, you know, let it doesn't have to be contrived or hokey. Let's do really practical things. And let's just make sure that as we're that we're moving forward, that black and brown people are, are right locked arms with us. You got a yes on Facebook for that. So <laughs> Candace, did you have a question? Well, I I'm like you, Miss Kim. I I work with people for some enjoy and I would never I don't want to say anything bad about them, but I would never be a part of it because I just thought, oh, um, why do white people? on the board. And so since I got the job, I'm like, okay, I can bring more people in that's more doubles. But if I never got the job, I would never be a part of it. Not to put down them, but there's no diversity in it. So it's like, how do we get that diversity from the self-advocate side to be a part of this a good movement. So you're I breaking the that. you're breaking the the glass ceiling over there, Candace. Mm -hmm. Good for I you. Just wear shoes. Yeah, um, my buddy Sean and I we have talked about really um, if we really just demystify um, some of these processes and explain, uh, for example, um, what the what opportunities these benefits support um, that is a huge like racial uh, economic like barrier breaker right there. Just honestly, just demystifying these processes, we're all gonna push together. Um, when we, as we were talking and um, I was, and Sean was sharing how um, understanding what voc rehab offers for Missouri versus Kansas. Knowing that in Kansas, um, Voc Rehab will pay for a used car for someone who um, is licensed with a disability, whereas in Missouri, it Missouri doesn't pay for a used car. When you talk about mobilizing families to advocate, I bet you I can get some black and brown families to advocate for cars just like Kansas has, 
But so often we come into these rooms and we have these really like, I don't know, pie in the sky, esoteric discussions where people don't really know where to land. They don't know what to push for. If we just explain some of these processes simplistically and let people know what's at stake, what's available, compare and contrast, then we have an advocacy agenda. We just have to redefine advocacy and not just always say that the more meetings you go to, mm -hmm. then the more of an advocate you are. And, and the systems are set up to, to prevent people from using them mm -hmm. as, a way to, as a way to not spend money. And, and, and the way to, to beat them at that game is to ask for what the system is supposed to be providing and to, mm -hmm. and to demand it. And, and so, and, and then understand what, what is there that you can't ask for, that people just don't, have, don't, don't do sometimes. Yes, and Sean, um, remember our last conversation, I was saying that we have got to stop calling it government benefits and we got to call it taxpayer benefits because I don't know about you, but there's my gross salary and then there's my net salary, my take-home pay mm -hmm. and all in the middle, those it's are taxes, taxes. <laughs> that I don't have a choice to pay. And so instead of us just being apathetic and saying, well, that's the government, we need to demand that our tax dollars mm -hmm. work for us in the way they need to work. We need to demand systems change. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's an insidious message. People who don't want government to work for people mm -hmm. set government up to fail. And, and then they put out messages like, oh, that's just the government. Well, what can you expect? Well, actually, it's our government. We can expect good things and we should expect good things and demand good things. And, and so we can't, shouldn't play that game that, that they're setting up to just dismiss um, incompetence. That's right. Rahel, you had um, your hand up a little bit ago. Do you have a question or comments? Yeah, and I guess I was just gonna mention something. Um, it might be going back to what we just talked about, but you know, when we say black, um, not all blacks are born and raised here. So uh, to answer Leah's question, how we can reach those people, I feel like we assume because their skin color is brown and they're black, so every black is you know the same, and uh, the way we approach them is the same way as you know the American born and raised Amer um, black people. But um, I think we we need to remember that there is language and cultural differences in even within the black you know the black skin black people. Well, I'm not like Kim. I I envy Kim. You know when she's so brave to um, you know you know speak without any any difficult or even to express what she wants to say easily. And um, I'm not like that. And I know there are um, a lot of them with you know, language barrier and cultural differences within the black community. So I think we need to go out to that community and create um, connection, a trust uh, with them, you know, not out there to inspect them or to get social services on them, <laughs> but just to have to create a friendship and a relationship with with that community, then they will be able to open up and share and teach us their culture. So I I think the problem with passing that is we always assume all blacks in one box and then white in the other. But there is also more diversity in so many ways within that one box, and I think we need to keep that in mind. Yes, and I think sometimes, um, and, I, and I probably can say this from my point, um, you know, I want to go out and be friends with everybody, and I want to make friends and find ways to help more people, and I make friends with those that I'm connected to. Like Rahel, you started coming to these. So that's when we became, you know, we got to know each other because you came to the to this um session one time. 
And Kim, you and I got connected because we were working on a project, you know, and so yes, I consider both of you friends and all that, but like, where do I go and how do I start up a friendship if, if they're not coming to me? Well, I think we we just create some opportunities. For um, them to come to me. Or just to collaborate. Again, um, once, you know, so for um, people who are shoppers, if you have a big sale, they will find the sale and they will uh, go through the aisles and run into each other. Oh, did you see this? Where did you get that? Well, it was down there. It's 60% off. It's 60% off. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and so we find each other and we, a friendship is born, right? Um, so I think that um, we could, we have to just um, not force it, <laughs> but. Right. Um, and that's the thing is I don't, you know, I don't want it look, I don't want it to look like it's forced. You know, yeah. I have always been a natural person, you know, and, um, and yes, Candace says, what about me? I love you to death, little girl. <laughs> um, but, and that's the thing is I don't ever want to look like I'm trying to force myself on anybody. You know, um, I think that we create um, some, um, just some opportunities to collaborate. I was thinking of um, one of the things that we want to do with the Transition Academy is we want to make sure we're mainstream. And mm -hmm. so um, when we were talking about the entrepreneurship cohort, we're having um, Dan, um, Dan Smith is the CEO of the Porterhouse, um, and he focuses on entrepreneurship training for African-Americans. And um, so I said, Dan, why don't you moderate the panel? And then after it's over with, let's collaborate and let's develop um, a um, cohort together. And so... Um, and, and so I was also thinking of how can our kids just, um, first of all, enjoy life? Yeah. You know? um, and so I kept thinking of, wouldn't it be great if we had a group of volunteers of kids who were just getting experience and we could um, volunteer at the different walks and the different charity groups where we could kind of be, you know, some of those like volunteer committees. So the stuff packets and do things like that mm -hmm. and just be a natural part of the community. Um, and so I have some of these ideas, but I think reaching out to some of our friends um, across the metro to say, what do you think if we all kind of flesh this out together? Um, and then from that, those part, those friendships develop. You, you know, yeah. we actually meet someone we never met. So I think we we start dreaming and we um, bring some people into our dreams and, and we girl, I am a dreamer. I'm a big picture dreamer. So um, definitely much to the chagrin of some of my coworkers at Lend, they're like, oh, she's got another big project she again. wants to do. <laughs> um, we gotta, we don't have enough people anymore. Um, but I would definitely please always think and include Lend, Kansas Lend. Um, we definitely want to participate in all of that and collaborate, um, and, and bring, you know, I mean, you and I talked about this before. It's, it's not about us. It's about the kiddo and kiddos, young adults, and adults that have disabilities. And that's what we're all here for. It's, it's not about us. We're not on the stage, you know. It, we're here to make a better life for all of them. So, um, yeah, whatever, you know, we can do to help the Transition Academy or, um, you know, projects that we can work on, whatever, just always think of us because I know we would love to do that um yeah so well wow it's 7 30 this went fast we could probably sit and talk for another hour and a half um i know i could um lots to learn um for myself personally um so i want to thank you kim for coming tonight and talking to us and um, being open and sharing um the experiences and philip and rahel Thank you for um, coming out of your comfort zones. Um, I know Rahel is not always um, want to be um, talking um, and whatnot, but she did that and I'm very proud of her for doing that. So thank you for doing that as well, Rahel and Philip, sharing your successes and experiences. 
and Candace, um, you know, sharing where you're going. Um, I think it's great. So um, we will have information coming out soon about our next training, but I thank you and I appreciate you all tonight and I hope you have a fantastic weekend because this is my Friday. <laughs> so.